I'd like to welcome Julie and thank her for coming along this afternoon to share her knowledge about Frederick Menkins, who was an architect in Newcastle and also designed buildings uh, in quite a few other places in the Hunter Valley. Now, not being a native Newcastle girl myself, when Julie suggested that she would like to do this talk for us, I thought to myself, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I did a fair bit of research and found what an amazing collection of buildings uh, Frederick Menkins has designed for our city. And I'm not afraid to uh, say that I was totally ignorant of him. Um, that's what I love about coming to these meetings myself. I find out so much information about Newcastle, our family history, our history, our local history. You go away from the meeting knowing so much more. Now, I don't really think Julie needs much introduction because we all know her. Uh, Julie's written quite a few books on uh, a variety of suburbs around Newcastle. She's been a long-term member here at the Society. For some years, she was on the management team. And she is the most wonderfully supportive person to the Family History Society. So, Julie, welcome. And I'll hand over to you. Um, Frederick Menkins is so important in our architectural um, heritage. Um, he was perhaps the most important architect in Newcastle from about 1880 to the turn of the century. Now, I'm not an architect, so basically I cannot assess him from an architectural point of view. This is an assessment basically from a historical point of view. Um, and we acknowledge the Warwickville people, traditional owners of the land. And Frederick Meekins, born 1854 to 1910, and perhaps you can figure out from his name, um, he's German. Um, now, there's a great book called The Early Architects of the Hunter Region, and this is two comments. Frederick Menkins was the only early Newcastle architect to have had full-time architectural training. Others sometimes were articled as students to already practising architects for four or five years after school education or worked as builders. So Menkins actually studied building and architecture for a considerably longer period. And another quote, German-born Frederick Menkins is the most significant of the architects working in Newcastle for 20 years from the 1880s, and many of his buildings still contribute to the town state of Newcastle. So he was born in um, northeastern Germany. Now, his father was in the trade. His father was a master mason, and he was res respected. Um, he had very good drawing skills and practical skills. And in 19th century Germany, there were two branches of architectural training, the academic and the practical. So basically the environment in Europe was very different to the environment in Australia, obviously. Being um, the penal settlement, um, there obviously wasn't the educational facilities, but of course over in Europe things were different. Now, he studied for over nine years. The employment prospects were limited. It was a time of political instability in Europe. Now, Frederick was a pacifist, and it was not a good time to be a pacifist. So um, he realised he would have to do military service, so he decided to leave his home country. And adding to the mix, Menkins and his father didn't get on, and so... In 1876, he arrived in Adelaide after a three-month voyage from London. Now, you have to feel for him because, basically, he had a difficult and lonely life in Australia. He had limited English, no money, no friends, but he was dedicated to architecture. So he did some work in the colonial officer, architect's office in Adelaide but decided to move to Melbourne. Unfortunately, luck wasn't on his side because there was little work there. 
He travelled to a number of towns, including Sandhurst and Tuca in Victoria, Sydney, Maitland, and eventually to Newcastle. And for most of his time in Newcastle, he lived at the Great Northern Hotel, which was close to his office and building sites. Of course, that proved to be a bit of an issue. He died of cirrhosis of the liver. <laughs> so, um, fortunately, when he arrived in Newcastle, that was a period of rapid growth. And according to NAG's Almanac, the great commercial and social strides made by Newcastle during the past few years is almost unparalleled in the history of towns or cities in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, that basically was because of the expansion of the coal industry in the area. You know, um, mines were opening, mines were going to the coal fields. So um, very important as a growth period. Now, um, you can see from the population figures, in 1882, there were 31,000 people in Newcastle. Um, about eight years later, it had jumped 49,000. So huge expansion. Coal was the main export, but wool also increased in importance. The main reason for that was, previously the arrangement was everything had to go to Sydney and then go elsewhere. Right, stuff wasn't allowed to come to Newcastle. But fortunately, that arrangement changed so that the north and northwestern districts, they could then send their projects to Newcastle instead of going to Sydney and sort of back up to Newcastle and elsewhere. And of course, there are a lot of industries that um, were set, being set up. And of course, the railway expanded as well. So that was a huge impetus to growth. Now, in 1884, he put an ad in the Newcastle Morning Herald, a miners advocate. Basically, he set out um, his qualifications and um, he had a number of referees. Now, just look at the people he had as referees. He's got the Attorney General. He's got the Right Reverend James Murray, the Bishop of Maitland the Catholic Bishop of Maitland. He's got the Council of the Borough of Newcastle, a number of MLAs. He's got a number of JPs, including Clarence Hannell. So basically, he was obviously very good at network. He knew who to um, contact. Now, the Catholic Bishop of Maitland and Clarence Hannell were to prove to be important contacts Minkins was engaged to do an extension to Newcastle Hospital in 1884. And James Hannell and his son Clarence were very active in raising funds for the hospital. And so um, the extension that was done in 1884 was named the Hannell Wing. Now, um, Minkins didn't obviously um, designed the original hospital building. The original one was done by Thomas Rowe in a Gothic revivalist style and basically Menken sort of um, did it in a similar style. So this is the original hospital in Newcastle in the 1860s and it was extended southwards. So that was the extension that Menken did. Another of his early works was the Redemptorist Monastery, Monastery at Mayfield. Obviously, this was work for the Catholic Church. It was a building three storeys high and was situated on a prominent hilltop. It took two years to build and was very stark in appearance. Now, the church specified that there were to be no ornaments or decorations, and this was an issue for Menkins because that's not how he did things. Um, the church did relent and allow sort of carpets and other features such as cornices to be in the area reserved for guests. But as regards the um, top floor, which was for the um, priests, their rooms were basically like cells, very sort of tiny, austere, basics, um, bed, desk, that was it. And it was only on sort of this level the entry level where there was any sort of um, 
design features. So this was built in 1885. Fortunately, it still stands. Um, I couldn't pick up the deterioration in the building, unfortunately. That's very um, sad to see what it's like at the moment. Um, you can't pick up the sort of weeds growing in the um, drain pipes and all this other sort of stuff and gutters. Um, it's not well looked after, this tarp hole and things in front of the old chapel. And that's the side view of it, you know, complete with the fence and graffiti and, you know, it's had better days. And at the moment, it's used for accommodation. Now, I don't know what sort of accommodation, but I assume it's um, student accommodation or something like that. So, still stands, but is it, is it um, Woodstock Street. So, I'm lost. Oh, you're lost? Yeah. One of the ones that goes up to Bull Street, if you know where Bull Street oh, is. Yeah. It's off that. Um, all right. So, with regards to the projects for the Catholic Church, um, most of them were done for the Sisters of Mercy. So besides the monastery, there's the Morris Brothers Complex at Hamilton, the Deaf and Dumb Institute, and a number of churches, schools, convents, additions to convents, and presbytery. Um, as you can see, they're not all in the Newcastle area, so we certainly travelled up the, um, the valley. Um, now... This is um, another one of these early projects. This is Stuart Kitely's home. And basically this still stands. At the top of the terrace, where it intersects with Cliff Street, so it's right up the top of the terrace. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't apparently have all its internal fittings. Some of those were removed in earlier times, so perhaps the cedar and all that sort of stuff isn't there still. But certainly it's a very imposing house, as you would expect. Um, Kitely was the manager of the Newcastle Coal Company for 30 years. And his residence was the first one that had um, water turned on in Newcastle. So he was certainly high up VIPs. Now, I get rather depressed when I go past this complex. Mm -hmm. This is Steggers Emporium, built in 1986. And when it was built, it was a beautiful building. This is a water fountain here, and it would have had a lot of um, woodwork, uh, mirrors, glass frontages, and ornamentation, especially on the top up there. Yeah. All right. Now, unfortunately, this is what it looks like now. Now, this is the corner of Hunter and Union Streets. Um, so a lot of the ornamentation is gone from on top of the um, roof line. The absolutely ghastly colours that it's painting now, especially this very ugly blue. Um, but it's just rather depressing. That's a depressed part of Hunter Street anyhow. You know, so that area is not well maintained and it's just rather sad to think that, you know, this gorgeous structure and that's what it is today. So we need someone with a lot of money to come and buy a building such as this. Another piece from 1886 with the Benevolent Asylum in Waratah. So who knows what that is today? Yeah. Yeah. So they've been awful buildings. Yeah, right. You can't see the front anymore. Oh, yeah. And so this is the building we're talking about. Um, fortunately, there was a social justice component to a number of the wealthy people in Newcastle. And they did a lot of fundraising to help those who were very um poorly off. Now, um, this was built, Basis Turton Road. Um, I'm not referring to these two things here. These um, buildings were for senior citizens and those facilities were built once again through fundraising efforts. And one of those in particular who did the fundraising was the um, Arnott family. So a lot of prominent families 
had a social conscience, which is a plus to sort of read about. Um, this is the Mechanics Institute in Hamilton. Now, fortunately, that still stands. This space is Milton Street, and this is Tudor Street this side, and this is what it looks like. Um, on the right is a view of what it's like today. So we're very fortunate that someone had the vision to buy this because 70s and 80s, it was an ugly structure. Some of you might remember Matt Bain's catering. Oh, thank you. Um, catering here, and of course there was the um, old RSL club that certainly mm -hmm. got into a bad state of repair. Um, but fortunately someone had the vision and they have done it up. And basically it's a residential complex. So it's had an extension on it um, to the side and at the rear. Um, now this is the Earth Gillum and Company warehouse in Telford Street, so right up the top of town. And it basically stored imported goods. So basically they had to get the goods from the ships and they were bought in and stored in this warehouse. Now, Newcastle had a number of large warehouses because obviously we're a port city, so a lot was imported. Now, um, I'll read this because it shows you why I can't comment from an architectural point of view. Despite the callous and shabby neglect of recent years, one can still recognise that the Earth Gillum Bond store was a masterpiece. It combined a functional structural system with the elegance of classical and original detailing. The articulation of the handling systems was clearly defined in the two long elevations. One can trace the movement of the goods from the walls to the loading bays facing the harbour, the raising via the hoisting arms, the lateral passage into the store, the dispatch via a similar method to the land on the south side. Counterbalanced with this functional articulation was the use of two different coloured bricks and the handsomely proportioned, classically inspired entry mm -hmm. facade. Now that is obviously written by an architect. Um, I got that from Lincoln's Centenary Exhibition publication. And obviously if you are an architect, you have a different way of describing mm -hmm. things. I could never write something like that. So, but fortunately this still stands. Um, has been converted to um, residential, and I think it might have a few shops on the ground level, does it? Mm -hmm. It does. It's right up the top of town, it's beautiful anyhow, so fortunately it still stands. Um, the Baptist Tabernacle in Layman Street. Um, so. All right, so this is what we're talking about um, near the cultural centre in town. Um, built with an elaborately rendered and pedimental Corinthian facade. Um, it was designed with good acoustics so that choirs and orchestras could support the church services. And it was the main Baptist church in Newcastle and a school hall and classrooms were located in the basement. Now, I didn't know this, but church property is protected by the constitution as the church was unwilling to sell the property, um, council couldn't take it over to make way for the cultural centre. Mm -hmm. So we still have it. Yeah. So looks basically council just wanted to demolish it. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it didn't. Um, so you can see obviously the cultural centre next door and that still stands. And I've actually been asked that when it's been opened and gone and you have a look, so you might find at times um, if you're in that area, um, it might be open. Now, opposite that is St Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Now, two comments from architects. The outstanding St Andrew's Church remains to this day probably the finest building in Newcastle. And Brian Suters um, said that. And in Architecture Newcastle, which is a book, the yellow brickwork church with 
Thanks, going on mutation and spire is the finest ecclesiastical work of meetings. So, um, this is a review of it, just to put it in context. We're talking, this is Layman Street. So, the Baptist Tabernacle is there, and St. Andrew's is here, and this is Auckland Street here. Now, there was a rectory. Um, but that is no longer there. That's been demolished. But you might recognise the um, Crossing Keeper's House. That's from the time when the AA Company and the um, Burwood Colliery had a railway line going into um, the harbour and they crossed. The AA Company's railway crossed with the Burwood and that is the crossing keeper's hats. And of course, this is here, is the start of Civic Park. So if you're in that area, um, you know, Menken's finest ecclesiastical work and the Baptist Tabernacle. And just as an aside, um, if you're in that area, that is a remnant parapet of the road bridge. So that dates back to AA Company times. Unfortunately, in the last few years, it's applied some graffiti, but that certainly is an important um, historical remnant from the AA uh, history's time in Newcastle. So how many people are aware that that's the significance of that? Oh, well, good. So if you don't, have a look at it next time. It's, um, yeah, very good. Now, in 1891, Council wanted to build a new town hall and Meekins contributed drawings. Um, he used a non de plume for Federation and it was to cover an entire block and face the harbour and we're talking in the vicinity of Market Square. So it was to be quite a large structure. It was to have 42 shops, 30 rentable offices, a town hall and council chambers. It was shelved due to disagreements between aldermen. So unfortunately, it didn't go ahead. And his compensation was basically a hundred pounds. Now this is the plan for the town hall. Oh. Now, if you can imagine the amount of work that he put into designing that, and unfortunately, he got a lousy a hundred pounds for it. But that structure would have been in Hunter Street near Market Square. Mm. Reminds me a little bit of the Queen Victoria building about the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, very definitely. So if the aldermen had have agreed, we would have had that as say our town hall instead of one at six. All right. Now continuing on. This is the David Cohen warehouse, and it is a monochromatic dark red facade and brickwork masterpiece. And Architecture Newcastle describes it as one of the best examples of this era of the warehouse in Australia. And um, basically, um, that is a comment from the National Trust, and of course, it is heritage listed. Um, Apparently, the style of brickwork is quite difficult to execute. Um, and fortunately, it still stands today. So the facade has been preserved and a parking station operates from the structure. So that's in Baldwin Street. Now, disappointed with the outcome of the Town Hall project, Menken's designed his masterpiece. This was built to Joseph Wood, the wine and spirit merchant um, who had the Castle Main Brewery. Wood's chambers provided offices and an option room. And one of the newspaper reports stated it was a build of great power and not surpassed in the colony. And it's got a Baroque facade. Um, and that's, that's what I'm referring to. Right, and 
is described as having an undulating moving out as well as up. The facade is enriched with heads of Atlas and Hercules, Thomas with her globe, grimacing monsters and delicate princesses. The organic structure is again accentuated by the fan-like vault of the oriel windows and the modelling proportions and movement are breathtaking and uh, still evident, mm, despite something. Okay, but basically that's it. Scott Street. All right, so we've got... Um, Commerce up here with her globe. Then we've got the heads of Atlas, and that's Hercules, and the grimacing monsters yeah, <laughs> and the oriel windows. Now, the oriel windows are a bay window that doesn't reach the ground, so they sort of just jut out. So if you're in this area, you should just look at the details on this. You know, it's just an outstanding building. Now, this is my poor attempt to get a picture of the facade and just to point out some of these um, features. You know, you don't sort of realise the details until you actually stand and look at it and just think, you know, what a magnificent building it is. Now, um, fortunately, it still stands. Um but unfortunately, it's not particularly well looked after at the moment. But Mankins had his office here on the first floor between 1893 and 1902. Of course, it's very close for him to just walk up to the Great Northern Hotel to his home. And, um, Wood died in 1908, and the building was purchased by William Longworth. So as some of you might know, it was the Longworth mm -hmm. Institute. Um, it became a cultural centre with library, art gallery and concert hall. And then he gifted the building to the Australasian Society of Patriots and was known as the Empire Club. Now, this is, um, is an interesting sort of group. It was formed in 1918 in Newcastle, had 200 members, and it was a breakaway group of the Australian Natives Association. <laughs> That is white Australian Olympic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> mm. Mm. yes. <laughs> so from 1946, it was home to the Air Force Club. And then the building was renovated in 1990s by Suter's mm. Architects. And Suter's noted that Menkins poured his heart and soul into the project. Um, it had some unusual features, including lead between the floors to mm. deaden the sound and a glass roof to let in light. So, I mean, you mm. know, he really was, yeah, extremely good. Now, just um, a comment. If you go and look at the facade of this building, there's this plaque here. Um, now, it was erected by the Australasian Society of Patriots um, to mark the vicinity of Lieutenant John Shortland's landing place in 1797. Historians don't agree with that. So um, historians generally agree that the landing place was in the vicinity of Fort, Fort Scratchley. But the Patriot Society put up this plaque and it's still there today, but perhaps not entirely accurate. Julie, I noticed you had now question mark, question mark. Yep. It's been sold to two um, artists. As I forget, I've just forgotten the young man, the man um, is well known in Newcastle. I've totally forgotten his name, Juan Carlos. And he, because it was, it was a club for a while. Yeah, uh, but I yes. guess they didn't have enough business. Yes. Anyway, these two artists yeah. have bought it and as their home. As their home? Yeah. I think they've won a big prize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're well known artists. What's in the Newcastle Herald? How long ago are we talking? Three years. Two or three years, I think, and not that long ago. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to know. Let's hope, let's hope for it. But there will be. Yeah, but unfortunately, artists, they don't normally. I know. Do it. But he, he, <laughs> he, the pockets. He sells his work. So the reason he's been bought by is not well. Paid. Really? 
Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't look well kept from the front at the moment. Yeah. 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 Maybe they're useful in that new time. Oh, well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I mean, it is a fabulous building, you know, and these features like the lead between floors to dead yeah. sound. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it was a forward thinker. Gosh. All right, now, Deaf and Dumb Institute in Waratah. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, you can't see a lot of this from the road because um, there's an aged care facility and a lot of units have been um, built in front of it. But also, um, these verandas on the side were basically demolished for extensions to the aged care facility. So the building as you see it today is not how it was built. Um, and uh, as I say, there are aged care units all in the front, so they block off the view to a great extent. Um, now the thing, um, this was such a big deal when this was built, basically um, deaf and dumb people came here throughout the country. And that was because they could get in because there was a railway station at Waratah. Oh, yeah. So they were able to travel by rail to get here. And so that's why, as I say, it was such a big deal for the education of deaf and dumb at this point in time. Now, um, Mingham's also designed some houses, and one of them is Lance Villa. It was designed in 1890, and we're talking um, Church Street. So if you go along Church Street, you'll see this. It's two stories at the back, um, three or four at the rear, and basically extensive views out of, mm -hmm. over the harbour. So, I mean, absolutely beautiful location. Um, Walls End Hospital was designed by Minkins in 1892, and um, this was basically for the miners initially. Um, Unfortunately, when they went to extend it, they found the foundations wouldn't take another floor, so they actually demolished the building so it no longer stands. Yeah, this way. All right, so this is the Sisters of Mercy Convent at Singleton, um, 1892. So if anyone has um, had the opportunity to go inside that, um, perhaps one of the most outstanding features is the chapel. Um, you go into the chapel and seats aren't in the traditional way of facing the altar, but they're on the sides, and so the nuns would have looked at each other rather than looking at the altar. Mm -hmm. But it's a, um, it's a beautiful um, chapel, and there are various paintings and things like that. And if they have an open day, it's um, worthwhile having a look at. So once again, we've got the Catholic connection. Um, now, this is a side view of Jessamine House. Now, Meekins is a sign um, Jessamine House. They designed this um, rear section. So basically, that was servants' quarters and the kitchen. And um, if you're not familiar with where this is, we've got Barker Street here, Ordnance Street there, and um, a lot of people from an historical point of view would regard this as being one of the houses in Newcastle. Um, it was last sold in 2008 for $7 million, but... Um, Allowing for an inflation that's probably worth about 11 or 12, but I imagine it could even get more than that. And just as a side thing, this here uh, is now a residence, but originally it was a single story building and that was the coach house, the Jasmine oh. House. So, Do you think this to the widow's walk? Is it the belief that was an favour? Uh, no, I don't think it was. Um, and most of the publications that I've read only mentions this, the kitchen and the servants' quarters. Uh, that was certainly out of later, though. That wasn't part of the original Jessamine House. All right, now this is the Boltons. Now, um, these are a bit out of the way. Um, they were constructed through Mrs. Bode, who lived in the rear property facing Church Street. 
So if you go along Church Street near Meekins Lane, see this big um, old house, the lower levels of stone. If you walk down past that, you come to these four weatherboard houses. So basically, she had four daughters, so she bought, built each daughter a house. Um, and when you go there, you basically, you walk down the laneway, Meekins Lane, before coming to these houses, you near the first shaft that was sunk by the AA company. So very historic area and um, yeah, just quaint just seeing these four weatherboard houses for the four daughters. All right, now this is um, Cullen's Warehouse. Um, this is obviously Scott Street and this is the intersection of Market Street here. Now, the reason this gained prominence was unfortunately it caught fire. Mm -hmm. And I think that that must be a horrible thing for an architect, someone who's mm -hmm. put a lot of effort and time, etc., into a building like this, you know, to have it turn out like that. So basically, um, it was a warehouse. And at the time, these warehouses stored all sorts of things, some of them volatile, and unfortunately there have been a number of fires in the warehouses. And I'd just like to acknowledge the... They had... Um, they were very, very brave people. They didn't have many resources, and just the thought of having a big ladder like that up against that structure and you think, God, oh, is that going to fall at any time? So I just want to acknowledge the um, fire brigade. When, when was it? When was it? Oh, sorry, I've got the fire. It's 1908. Um, it was built towards the end of the century. I think it would be uh, up about 10 years or something. But, um, just there all that long. No. Oh, no, no. So most of the heat came from the first floor where they stored um, paint soils and ironmongery. And then the northern wall fell onto Scott Street and, of course, the railway line. So they had to stop all the rail and tram services. Now, the cost of the fire was estimated to be a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and Maitland Mercury described it as being the most disastrous fire in the history of this city. There have in the past been fires in this city that have covered a larger area and have been somewhat grander when regarded merely as spectacles. But the outbreak of this morning easily surpasses the norm in point of damage done. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and basically, Menken's built another warehouse. I'm oh, sorry, designed another warehouse to replace that one. Um, now, um, this is what was built in its place. So this is the replacement warehouse. So once again, we're talking Scott Street, and this is Market Street here. So um, that still stands today, and there was enormous demand for warehousing facilities at this point in time. Um, this is just another aspect of it, just to put in context of where it is. Of course, you know, we've got the view of the cathedral at the moment. Um, so one of the developers wants to encroach on that view. Um, so in 1907, Menken's put in Another notice in the paper to say that he has a partner, F. Castleton, and so the business was carried on to the name of Meekins and Castleton. Um, now, this is another private home that um, Meekins designed. This was a design for John Hall. He was an importer, so he had a um, thriving business. Um, this is in Barker Street, which is in the same street as Jesmond House, just a few doors down from Jesmond House. 
Um, a feature of it was the extensive woodwork on the verandas and the outside of the house. And as you can see, a very, very substantial residence. Now, this is what it looks like today. Unfortunately, they've enclosed the front veranda, so you can't see the wood detailing. You can see a bit of a side here, which is open. Um, so, substantial residence that's high up had extensive use. Now, this family, um, the son, R. Uh, Hall, he continued on the family business, had warehouses, and as you can see, another one to go up in flames. Um, and then um, this is the replacement building. Um, once again, this is in Scott Street, and some of you would have remembered Rundles. Mm -hmm. They're still available in Hunter Street. In Hunter Street, yes. Yes, yeah. not this one. They've moved, oh, yes, no. Newcastle West. Um, so this is sort of that's the building I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so this is the signal box. And um, basically this warehouse was designed by Menkins in 1899 and it replaced the burnt out half uh, and sun structure. And it was converted to apartments in 1998 and it has a display of Nathan's memorabilia inside. So mm -hmm. it's actually called Nathan's Apartments. So his legacy still lives on in that um, building. Now, <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> it's noted that the meticulous attention to detail, which is so apparent in his buildings, is also revealed in his actions, character, and appearance. <laughs> One could hardly imagine a more perfect picture of a gentleman than the photograph of Menkins and his dog. I mean, it's, it's perfect. It's staged, isn't it? The silk, <laughs> the silk top hat, the elegant. Kids may, the tailored coat, the waistcoat and gold chain and the goatee beard, tapered to punctuate the fine featured visage, all combined to produce an air of quiet perfection, touched with gentle humour. <laughs> now, do you wonder how he got the doll to sit like that so perfectly? Um, but his attention to detail. It's just extraordinary. Um, now, as regards Menkins the person, he was stubborn, dedicated, and a hard worker. He believed that success could only be achieved by energy, perseverance, punctuality, and sincerity. He had a high standard of moral ethics. He was against the war and placed importance on his reputation. Um, meticulous attention to detail shown in his drawings. On building sites, he would show bricklayers how he wanted bricks laid and would check measurements on site. So he was very hands-on. He wanted things done a certain way. And um, apparently he was just merciless as regards the um, contractors. Whilst doing extensions to Jetsman House, Menkins accused Harry Kingsbury, an electrical contractor, of substituting an inferior metal for the lightning rods. <laughs> Menkins was sued lost the case, was fined 40 shillings and elected to go to jail for a year. So, you know, he had principles. <laughs> now, it was noted in the newspaper, although battered when roused, Mr Menkins was essentially a peaceful man and in his work, the good workman, the good honest contractor was held by him in honour. But let a man once do deliberately bad work and his fate as a workman or contractor was sealed. He used to say that in his profession, above all, complete confidence in my workers is my only hope of good work. Mr Menkins was a lifelong student and of late years spent most of his lecture time amongst his books and papers. So he had high standards 
um, which was fine because he was a designer. He had an image of what he wanted to do and he expected the work to be carried out very well. Now, the paper also noted that he was a man of grit. He went to Darnhurst Jail rather than pay damages in a libel case um, while protecting his client's interests. He remained in jail for 12 months, although he could have released himself any day by payment of the amount. Numbers of his friends offered to pay it, but he steadily refused on principle. He served 12 months, sequestrated his estate, satisfied all his creditors but one, and came back to his work in Newcastle where he made a competency in the succeeding years. So he was prepared to remain in jail 12 months to prove a point. Um, so the main sources that I've got that information from is Architect in Newcastle, the booklet from Mankin's Centenary Exhibition, and the book by Les Ruthman, Early Architects of the Hunter, and I acknowledge the photographs from Newcastle Regional Library and the University of Newcastle Living Histories. So when I researched him, I just thought what a tremendous character he was. He was prepared to stand up for his principles. He obviously had an amazing mind as regards detail. Um, we're fortunate that we still have a number of buildings that still exist. Unfortunately, some of them need a bit of TLC. Um, but, you know, we're very fortunate that he was part of our architectural landscape and we can still enjoy some of his um, projects today. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Did he have a married? Uh, he actually married for um, five months. <laughs> the other question I have is he never built himself, like, organised to have his own house built. He only lived in the Great North. That's a bit of a sort of um, murky area. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, he had cirrhosis of the liver, so alcohol was a big part of his life. So it's a bit hard to determine whether it was his choice that he wanted to be in a hotel for that reason. Um, I can't find any mention of him living elsewhere, but that's not to mean to say he didn't. Yeah. You know? I just found it curious that, you know, all these beautiful buildings. Yes. And he never yes. had a home with his own that we know of. About years ago, single men mm -hmm. lived in hotels. Yeah. You know, they, mm -hmm. my father and his brothers did a hotel, for example. Yeah. You know, that was where they went. Yeah. Hotels were boarding houses. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, is the um, monastery heritage listed? Ah, uh, no. Oh, really? So no, it could be pulled out tomorrow. Um, or just to that time. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's probably on, no, I'll modify that. I think it's on the local heritage. Um, but I don't think it's state heritage. Right. So if it's on the local heritage, yeah. that means it can be demolished. Right. If, if things are on the state or the national yeah. heritage register, you'll have a lot more um, difficulty demolishing it. Okay, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's very sad to see the monastery and the Stegas um, building. You know. Oh, uh, demolition by neglect. It's a big thing oh. around Newcastle and that. It's just yes. appalling. Yes. yes. Now, I mean, if you didn't know Stiggers Emporium, you know, the mm -hmm. Union Street. I, I mean, do know yeah. it quite well. I had yeah, no idea, but it was such a, a massive integrated yes. structure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. See, with a lot of buildings in Newcastle, you've yeah. got to look up. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, first for wall level, yeah. but whereas down at street yeah. level, they've just been modified so much. But mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we don't value our heritage, and um, mm -hmm. yes, they could be demolished. I've had the privilege of going through the papers of Brian Sutherland's and Guy on Megan's paper. Oh. Still the most extraordinarily fan of Megan's. Yes. He's got letters from his mother and father and backwards and forwards. He's got um, plans. He's got like, boxes and boxes of oh. Megan's stuff. Yeah. Um, and they were trying to get it into the university yeah. industry. Yeah. But there's just so much of it. Um, um, you know, they need volunteers to do it and that. And because Brian's now at 85 and not very well, but he's still, if you make his name, yep. um, and he's dragged me around town a few times telling me the history of all that. Oh. So he's a fascinating man. So I just hope that when he does go, that yes, they will be able to say these 
wonderful job with the blueprints of the convert. And oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Just, um, um, yes. And he's such a fan. And he was the one who actually did the, 19, uh, the 1978 exhibition that was yes. the yeah. driving force behind that. Yeah. Where do you know where he died? Uh, in Newcastle. Do you know where he's buried? Oh, Sandgate? Well, Meryl, I don't know. Maybe it is Sandgate. It's interesting where he would have. Yeah, I don't know. Have you ever seen any papers as to where he's buried? I haven't. I'm sorry. I'm have you seen where, where, where he's buried? Buried. Cemetery. Buried, yes. No. Oh, I haven't seen any reference to it. Yeah, what religion was he? I've uh, never come across his religion, but he's there. I know I'm just surprised because uh, a lot of the Germans were very, very Protestant and he did a lot of work for the Catholic Church. Yeah, so I'm just, I was just. His wondering. networking skills really surprised me. Yeah. Um, just seeing the people that he. But he might have been Catholic, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's yes. Yeah. I've just Googled uh, yeah. Yeah. Freddie Clinton. Mm -hmm. Okay, very. Yep. He returned to live in Sydney in his newly built house in a Baker Street for Edward. You're joking. Age 55, Benkins died childless at Redwick from cirrhosis on the 5th of March 1910. Oh, and was in the Anglican section of Waverley Cemetery. Oh, oh, well, I hope you appreciate Benkins the next time you saw yeah. him going past yeah. in of these places. Yeah. You might look at the design detail and just, you know, yeah. yeah.